But uh, the whole idea with this experiment was to see if we could, how long the shelf life of the produce would last if it was uh, grown using the, the plasma. Uh, this is a picture of our micro radish that we uh, supply to our customers. It's just the daikon radish and it's about seven days worth of growth and when those first two leaves come out then we just cut it and punnetize it so that restaurants and people use it as garnish on their meals and it's a very nutritious uh, to eat on its own as well packed full of vitamins and minerals so what we did with our radish uh, to get that we uh, soaked one batch of our radish seeds in plain water and then we soaked another batch of the seeds in a CO2 and CH3 plasma water. So this was just the water only, no, no gains in it. And we soaked the seeds for 24 hours. Both of them were seeded in plain cocoa fiber after that and uh, left to germinate. Then during the next seven days, each batch was watered uh, respectively with just the plain water and the other one with the plasma water. Both batches were harvested on the same day and packaged and what we had previously found the previous couple of years is, was that we only got around 11, 14, 15 days of shelf life on our radish. Here's a picture of uh, uh, soaking the seeds. So the one on the left was just soaking in water and the one on the right with the, the plasma water. So this is how we just left the seeds for 24 hours soaking in the water. We then planted them into the cocoa fiber in those punnets. And just to reiterate, the cocoa fiber is, is just a, a holding mechanism medium. There's no nutrition whatsoever in the cocoa fiber, which would affect either, either one. The seeds are covered with uh, cocoa fiber and vermiculite, and then they were watered respectively. So those that were soaked in CO2, we had watered again with uh, some of the GANS water of the CO2 and CH3. And the other seeds we just watered with plain water. Here you can see the pictures of them starting to germinate. The one on the left with the plasma radish and the one on the right with the plain water radish. So you can see they both, there's no difference between the two at, at this stage. And again we've got, uh, once they germinated and we just take the cocoa fiber off the top there and then when they are exposed to the light they'll start turning green. The water only and the plasma water, the comparison there, also no, no changes. And here's just before we started to harvest, the one on the left being plasma and the one on the right being just the water, plain water treatment. What we had noticed you know, up until this point, they both looked exactly the same, but uh, when we did harvest them, what we did notice was there's certainly a difference in the root structures between the two of them. The top row there was the root structures of the radish just in the water, and the bottom row is those that have been soaked in the plasma. So you can see that the, there's a more rigorous uh, root growth, it's uh, whiter, compared to the other one. So there, that was our own main, the main difference that we had uh, noticed at this point in time was just the, the, the enormous root growth compared to the plain water. So we cut the radish, uh, washed and placed into the containers. And then these two containers were placed in our fridge and we started the countdown. So that was day one. On day nine, what I've done is the photo on the left is always day one, and then I'm comparing it to the current photograph. So that would be day nine. At this stage, no change 
whatsoever. Please stay in 14. Now, normally, when we start getting to day 14, uh, previously our radish would start certainly going yellow. You would get a smell from it, and generally it wouldn't be able to eat it um, by that stage. It has a very short shelf life. Uh, but we've, with the, after 14 days, it was still looking very, very strong. Um, one could easily eat, eat that um, radish with no problems. On day 20, also virtually no change um, between from day 14, uh, still looking very good, no signs of any yellowing or, or writing at all. On day 28, we have the same, uh, still very green and no change in, in the state of, of the radish. Day 41, we had started seeing, you could see some of the radish had um, sort of put a discoloration there, going yellow, but otherwise the rest of it was, was still looking good. And when you felt the radish, it was still very, very firm and it hadn't gone soft or soggy uh, at all. There was another photograph that we took on day 47. And then we went to day 78, because then I'd forgotten about them. And uh, when I looked at them, you could see that they had started going yellow, a bit more yellowing on, on the, the plants there. At this stage, you probably wouldn't want to eat them, but even though there was no smell coming off the radish and no sign of, of any rotting of the radish at all, uh, but just that bit of uh, discoloration of the yellowing. Then we went all the way out to day 134. And here you can see that completely gone yellow, bits of green there, but still very no rotting happening. There was still no smell coming off, off the radish whatsoever. There's just a side view of, of those punnets. So you can see none of it had uh, sunk down to the bottom because generally that's what happens is it all sinks to the bottom and, and turns into a liquid and uh, just rots. But this is still quite firm and, and sort of spongy taking up all the space in the container. And then we went all the way out to 180 days and uh, yes, now we're starting to see uh, some degradation there and uh, the rotting of the of the micro radish but even when we opened it at this stage there was just no smell of rotting it was a, a vegetation smell and none of the uh, the real rotting smell that one would get from the uh, radish and you can see also at this stage the, the radish grown in the plasma uh, is almost identical a little bit better than the one grown in the water All right, so there's a side view of, of the radish and now you can see how it sort of settles to the bottom and it will just eventually rot and form a nice black puddle in the bottom of the container. At this stage, we, we thought the experiment was, was over and so we gave these to our chickens. Right, so when we look at the observations that we made from this experiment is that uh, since we started growing the radish, we've been doing it for about three years, um, none of our stuff had lost it beyond 15 days, um, even in our fridge and in, in retail shops. Um, we always had a very short shelf life uh, for this product. 
Um, and during this time, by the time it got to 15 days, uh, the rot would set in and then you would have a smell that would fill the room because of the sulfur coming off from, from the radish. Only after the sort of the 41 day mark could we smell a slight odor uh, from the water radish, but not the plasma radish. And I say that odor was more the vegetation odor. It was not the, the sort of sulfur smell that one would generally get from the radish. And we saw a bit of yellowing of, of some of the leaves in both containers. The interesting point here as well is the, the weight of the radish on day one was 47 grams. And even after day 41, it was still 44 grams. So it only lost three grams of moisture uh, during that entire period, uh, which is also quite astounding. And um, both were kept in the fridge at four degrees. Now, the big question is why did the radish grown with the water only last just as long as the radish grown with the plasma water? Because we're a bit stumped at first because uh, we thought that the plasma radish would, should have been far better than the radish just planted with the water. So that was a big question that we had to answer. So essentially, uh, because the water only radish and the plasma water radish had been sitting next to each other from the seeding stage, as you could see, when we soaked the seeds, they were next to each other. When we seeded them, they were next to each other. During the whole growth stage, they were next to each other. And then even in the fridge for the 180 days, uh, they were either sitting next to each other or on top of each other. So the plasma radish, um, the radish that we soaked in the plasma had been interacting with the water only radish. So the stronger fields were interacting with the weaker fields, thus causing the water only radish to last just as long as the plasma radish. So essentially what is happening is because the, they are both composed of the same material, they're both radish shoots, the one grown in plasma being of the stronger fields was interacting with the weaker one, which was the plain water one. And this was feeding and making sure that the water one stayed just as fresh as the plasma radish. And so you have that interaction from between the two. So the higher strength feeding the lower strength. And the connection is because they are of the same material. And then we had the next question was, why did it last so long in the fridge? Um, 180 days was a very long time for any produce to be sitting in, in the fridge. And then we have to go back to our CO2 story um, as to why when we use the CO2, why it works. And so we go back to, it's the connection between the amino acid structure of, of your seed and your plant, which is your carbons, oxygens, hydrogens, and nitrogens. So when you look at your CO2 GANs, it's your carbon oxygen is the connection between your CO2 and your plants, whether it's the seeds or the plant matter. So essentially by soaking the seeds in the CO2 water, we have created a magrav field strength around the seed and the plant. So we've changed the whole environment around the plants. So it's not just a case of feeding the seed and, oh, well, that's, it's going to change the seed. What it's done is it's created a whole new environment around that seed and plant. And when we look at food as to why food decays in our environment, uh, we Food decays because it is essentially losing its field strength to the environment. So this decay process is exactly the same as when a neutron decays into a proton and electron. The environment is the weaker field and the plant is the higher strength. So what's happening here is your field strength of your plants, especially the freshly grown plants, of a stronger field and they are giving into the environment which is your of your weaker fields so that is why we food rots if left open uh, or doesn't last very long in a fridge 
and the shelf life of your food always comes back down to how strong or healthy your original plant was um, when it was grown. So essentially the, the, the CO2 environment uh, is created a whole new field strength around the plant. Um, and we know that the CO2 has a magra field strength of 44 and your amino acids of your plants has a field strength of 43. So your CO2 had created an environment that was protecting the plants from your normal outside environment. And this is why it had lasted so much longer than, than before. So some of the implications is, can we place CO2, zinc and amino acids, plasma water in our fridges at home to extend the life of the fresh produce we buy from the stores? It's an interesting point there. Um, and can we place the same plasma waters in store shelves to extend the life of produce in the store? Now, my feeling is that it's best to start right at the source, so grow the food with the CO2, having the full nutrition, nutri nutri nutrients in the plant, and then you can extend the shelf life of those plants much longer. But um, this is all sort of open for people to test as well, is to try and place some uh, plasma devices in their fridges and just to see whether they their produce, fresh produce lasts longer than before. So we'll have a look on the next one was um, how the plants coped with the heat of summer. This was our very, very first experiment in uh, February of 2016. And here's just a photograph of uh, our aquaponics system. Now, for those that don't know what aquaponics is, essentially we have a fish tank in the background there with uh, fish. And we've got these four grow beds in front here. And then we have water circulating always 24 hours a day from one bed to the next. And then it circulates back to the fish tank and then through the water, through the beds again. So what is happening is the fish poo from the fish, um, that ammonia has been converted into nitrites and nitrates, and that's what the plants are using as their nitrogen source, is the nitrates from the fish. So it's a nice balanced system where the fish are feeding the plants and the plants are essentially cleaning the water for the fish. So we have no filters on the system at all. So let's just give you a background of how our system works. And with the uh, water, we have just polystyrene rafts which float on the water and just the little cups containing our seedlings are placed in those holes that you can see there. So this allows the plant to sit on top of the water while the roots are always in the water. And so we have that conversion of ammonia into nitrates for the plants. So that's just our source of, of nitrogen. Now the background for this one was um, every summer that we've grown here since we started, we've always experienced uh, extreme temperatures and the water in our system can get to 26, 29, sometimes 30 degrees, which is very high. And this causes uh, all sorts of damage to the root structure, uh, turning them brown. Um, the roots slowly disintegrate and die off and this causes the leaves to be very thin with no real weight to substance and not very healthy. Um, and our lettuce is stunted and sometimes it'll just start bolting. So we always have that problem in, in December time. And uh, it takes a much longer for the, our seedlings to grow six or seven weeks because they're really battling against the um, elements all the time. So in this one, we had uh, placed a bottle of uh, our GANS in the water. So we had a mixture of uh, seawater GANS, CO2 and CH3 that we had placed in the in the water. This was a very small amount of GANS. So it was literally just one little okay. uh, bottle mm -hmm. with a little bit of GANS at the bottom and, and filled with water. Uh, we just placed that into the water there so you can see it was just sitting and floating in the water. 
And the arrow on the right shows you the grow bed there and the arrow with where the bottle was uh, sitting. So this was planted 19th of February. And then you see on the picture on the right, 25 days later, um, we, we had lovely stunning lettuce. And then it was 25 days later. And then when, I, when we look at the uh, root structure there, um, it, it was quite incredible um, how nicely that the roots had been uh, maintained white and really, really healthy looking uh, root structure there for the plants. And what we had done, we, we had only placed this bottle into one of our systems um, and we've got uh, five systems there and so they're all separate and independent. Um, and what we found was we had only placed the, the bottle into one of them and then we watched how the other four systems were battling. And these were photographs that we had took on one of the hot days. It was 30 degrees outside. You could see the on the left, the lettuce were, were wilting and, and just not coping with, with the sun. And uh, you see the photograph there on the right. This was the lettuce that was in the uh, system with a plasma bottle. And they were just so upright as if there was no effect from, from the heat at all. The next photograph see, coming through was just showing you the difference in the root structure. Uh, you can see there's system one and system two, sort of browning of the roots, uh, not happily. If you actually go and pull on those roots, they were just pull off completely and disintegrate. Whereas the uh, plasma system there, the roots were just so vibrant and really, really healthy looking. So that was a very noticeable effect. So our observations from this one was, we had a very marked difference in the root structure um, of our lettuce grown with a plasma system. Um, and we only saw this type of root structure during the cooler months of the year. So we're looking sort of from April till September time, um, never during our, our hot period. Um, this has shown us that the plasma fields are allowing the plants to cope better with higher water and air temperatures. So even though we were still sitting with uh, close to 30 degrees in our water temperature there, the plants grew as if it uh, they were growing in water of 20 degrees. The, the high water temperature seemed to have no effect on them. The lettuce that were produced there was also much larger leaves. They were thicker and heavier, uh, which resulted in a nice higher yield for us. And it also grew within, a, within the normal time from the seedling stage was about four weeks instead of the six to seven weeks during our hot periods. And then we saw during the midday sun there that um, our normal lettuce would wilt, whereas the plasma lettuce would be able to cope with those um, heat conditions. So our lettuce were exhibiting, for us, they were exhibiting traits that we'd only see in the grain seasons of spring and autumn when it was cooler. And in this one, we'd only used about 50 mils of GANS mixture in 24,000 litres of water. That's how much water one of our systems contain. So you can end it was in a bottle, so we had never put any of the GANs directly into the water. So it was just the fields coming through the bottle and into the uh, water, which gave us those results. From then until now, uh, what we have done is uh, we've been slowly adding more and more bottles of GANs into our water. Um, I think in some of our systems now, we've probably got about 10 or 12 bottles in each one of our systems. So we've really, really ramped up the number of uh, gains that we've got into our system. We've also got CO2, CH3 and zinc in all the grow beds and we're gonna continue to um, add. And before I carry on, it's just a reminder that we sometimes do get stuck, uh, focused that these ganses are a fertilizer just remember that they are not a fertilizer. All they're doing is changing the environment uh, for the plants. Um, and then the plant is feeding itself. Yes. <laughs> so other observations between that first experiment and, and now is um, we've also been going through some very, very hot summer days with temperatures over 35 degrees Celsius. And 
we've seen the same thing. Our lettuce has not been affected by this heat at all. Uh, we've, re we've put the ganses in all of our systems now, um, so we have nothing to compare against. But um, the results that we've seen over the summer month is, is quite incredible. Um, we've constantly harvested healthy, very thick, heavy and vibrant lettuce throughout the summer period. Um, and this is our first summer where the heat has not had any effect on our production or quality. We're still producing the same amount of lettuce um, week in, week out, irrespective of, of the weather, whether we're having bits of rain and cooler weather or whether we're having temperatures and a couple of heat, heat waves of over 35 degrees. And we think it's because we've added all these additional bottles of GANS in our water. So we've really, really increased the environment, field environment around our, our lettuces. So there probably appears to be a threshold on the amount of GANS we need in relation to our volume of water that we're using, but also for your environment. You know, when we look back at our tomato plant, um, we, we only had same thing, one bottle in the system. And so it would be interesting, we'll try again during our winter months when we've got a lot more bottles of, of GANS in our water, whether we'll have the same effect or maybe the additional GANS will have really added and uh, increased that field strength around our plants. So we certainly seem to see that by adding more, we're getting better results. Well, you know, it's, you know, we're growing in, obviously we're growing in water, um, which is entirely different environment to people growing in the soil. But I think the, the soil, people growing in the soil will, will see the same effects. As long as you are, are really watering a lot of the uh, plasma water into your gardens um, and create that strong field around the plants. Um, we also know from our radish, when we grow in our radish, that the stays somehow need less water. So if people can just observe that when they've grown in the ground, that they might need to you know, not have to water their plants as much and they'll cope with the extreme heats without really needing a lot of water. Because I know Mr. Kesh has said that is one of the effects that one will see with your plants and using a CO2 is that you need less water um, for them. But um, yes, you know, we've, our results for this December time, December, January have been, been we're very happy with that. Um, and it's just a case of adding more and more ganses that we seem to be getting the better results. You know, we're not getting anything to the extreme where we're producing uh, 10 foot lettuces yet. Now that's still to come. And that's really looking at changing your environment and a stronger field around the lettuce. But uh, for now, it's a case of producing good, healthy, uh, food in, with, in extreme conditions. You know, when we, we go up the road to our friend who's the hydroponic farmer, on the day when it was 43 degrees Celsius, he's very busy hosing down all his lettuces because they're ready, ready to just, you know, give up. Whereas we didn't even have to worry about going and, and, and worrying about our stuff because it was just fine. You know, and this is, you know, so many farmers, it's an uphill battle continuously and um, and you're always battling the elements. So this way, it just makes it so much easier to grow your own food. Even if you're growing in your backyard or if you are a commercial farmer, it just takes the, um, the, the scary part away a little bit. Um, the only damage we've had with extreme heat at the moment is literally when we had... Um, 40 degree day, then we had 160 mils of rain, and then we had sort of 35 to 37 degrees. Um, some of the lettuces that had very tight cores um, and retained some of the rain sort of in between their leaves, the lettuces actually cooked slightly, which I don't think you can do anything about that unless we create our total magra greenhouse at this point. Um, I'm quite happy with the results um, with those few lettuces that did have a problem. It's a remarkable result, actually. Mm. Yes, and I think, you know, as I said before, um, people, we'd like to get a lot more feedback from people 
growing in the ground from their experience because um, ours is, is, is different. Um, and I think we'll probably get better results from growing in the ground because that is the more natural environment for plants is to grow in the ground, not, not in water that way, the way we're doing it. You know, the ground actually has things in it like bacteria and, and um, fungi and all sorts of things that are, are helping and increasing the field strengths around the plant and doing all sorts of things that we can't do in our sort of unnatural environment. So I, I think people in the, growing in the ground are going to get absolutely fabulous results from this. Yes, I can test it out and see in some regards. Uh, last season I had extraordinarily large oranges, which I put down to the fact that I sprayed uh, CO2 GANs uh, plasma all over the uh, flowers and the leaves of the trees. Um, I, th I think that's also maybe a, a test for the balls because um, as we've seen with the latest teachings, there is this, and I think we need to start emphasizing it quite dramatically, to see results, you've got to breach a threshold. And so you need to add more and more plasma until you see the results and, and you will get them. It's just maybe it's not strong enough until you get to a point where it is. Um, just like with the cancer cells that seem to need a threshold and then they all just disappear. So if we can create create fields and if they're not quite strong enough and you're not seeing anything you need to add more tools or figure out how to add more fields and remember when you hang things with a plasma dilution so if you've got two three four bottles just make one each one ever so slightly different so you can create the um the gradient so that the fields can flow okay yeah, so um, Oh. And then also the rings. The rings might also do quite well with the trees. Oh, I'm using balls at the moment, but uh, rings will be... Oh, I'll put some out too. Thanks very much. And the, the double rings seem to be much stronger than a single... You know, a double tube seems to be stronger than a, a, a one tube. What I'm going to do today is just to go through a, and, and Dr. Gatwa as well, is we're going through a couple of uh, people's experiments that they've done around the world and just the feedback that we've gotten from people. And um, it's, it's just a nice to show that from all parts of the world, people, we're getting very similar results. Um, and it's irrelevant of where we're growing uh, plants it's uh, we get getting the same nice results by using the ganses and in various using the ganses in any which way people have been playing with so i will start off with um the some of the work and experiments done by a fellow chap here in australia um, he lives in western australia uh, mr ross martin and he done quite a nice lot of work on that and Next couple of the slides are all his, with um, so there's a lot of information in his slides there. Just in terms of his brief background of his of his region and where he's growing, um, it's mainly uh, wheat and sheep production that he's involved in, and in, it's very hot, dry summers, uh, which is across most of Australia here, um, and. In general, as you were saying, fruit and vegetables are not grown due to lack of water. Um, so what he did was he tried different uh, plasma technology, used it in different ways, and um, he tried to grow different produce. And these are the results.
the first one was with um, a tomato plant. And what he had done was um, he had filled uh, different ping pong balls uh, with uh, CO2, uh, CH3 and, and copper. And so he used just different amounts in each of the balls so that he could form a gradient so that there would be a flow between each of the, the ping pong balls. He'd also placed a tube. So that's just a plastic vinyl tube filled with a liquid plasma water as well. And he placed this around the, the stem of one of the plants, which he said was sort of appeared to be growing quite slowly. He'd also hung many of these ping pong balls um, in his other fruit trees. The one was his uh, pink lady apple tree, um, and we hung with the uh, ping pong balls. And what he said was the fruit was sweet, juicy, and he produced quite a high yield off that, off that uh, apple tree. Now, a lot of the cases with agriculture, and when you start trying to do experiments in agriculture, it's very difficult to compare. So the only way that a lot of the farmers can compare and give results is based on previous years of observation and yield. So, you know, when somebody notices a difference, um, statistically, it's almost more than 20% of a difference. You know, under that, we don't really notice much. So when a farm or somebody notices a change and notices a higher yield compared to previous years, then there is certainly has been that change. But as I say in agriculture, it's, it is difficult to do a direct comparison. Now this next slide is quite busy, but it's showing you the effects on one of his cucumber plants. Now in number one, that's on the top, left there he was showing that um, this cucumber was sort of the flower was starting to die and it looked like that the whole plant had sort of finished its, its growth period so he hung a couple of these the ping pong balls filled with a, with a liquid plasma all over around the plant there you can see then picture number two and then when you look down at the bottom basically what happened was the plant started flowering again so it almost gave it a second lease of life. And it started growing, new cucumbers were growing and it sort of reinvigorated that plant, it gave it a second lease of life and he produced lovely cucumbers from that plant, which we, he thought was at the end of its uh, life cycle. Now, what he had noticed was hanging the uh, ping pong balls around his tomato plants in the beginning. And you see the next photograph when it does eventually come through. There you see on the left would have, would have been the uh, tomato plants with all the plasma balls that were hanging. And what he had noticed was that the punkiums growing on the ground in that immediate vicinity around these tomato plants, um, he noticed that there were a lot more, uh, the color was dark greener and the growth was, was far better than further away from that field. So just those ping pong balls hanging around the, the tomato plant had created quite a nice environment and extended quite far from that tomato plant. And there it grew, grew lovely um, punkiums there for him, for him there. So it was just noticing the effects of the field, you know, and how far that, that, that field interaction and how far it created an environment around those tomato plants. And as I said before, when you're doing any agriculture experiments, you really have to observe because you might only notice some subtle differences in the beginning. So just be very, very observant with, um, what you're doing in the plant surrounding any experiment that you're doing. So now the other one was on some of the other tomatoes that he was growing, a different variety. Um, it was a Grossa Lisa tomato plant. And 
And the photograph on the top left was uh, before he applied any, any of the plasma. And uh, there's photograph number two. So he'd placed five or six ping pong balls all around there. And he had beautiful ripe fruit. Um, now some plants showing developing fruit. Now he had unprecedented success with this plant because as in this past experience, um, these plants have always been subjected to wilt and red mite attack. Um, and generally in the very dry conditions like this, the large tomato plants don't grow very well. Um, and that was autumn time for him and the heavy fruit was growing, continuing. So the tomato plant was quite happy to continue to grow into the autumn period. And um, he was also spraying his plants with the liquid plasma water as well. Um, and was trying to see how far they would develop through into the winter months. He'd also done another variety of tomatoes. Um, and these were the beefsteak tomatoes, also a large variety. And again, just hanging ping pong balls with different gradients around it to create a nice flow. And um, there he had also lovely tomatoes coming through. And as he said in the past, he had very little success, success in growing this variety in that particular area. So, you know, it just shows that by using the plasma, we able to now start growing plants that don't generally grow, like to grow in a certain area, or are now able to, to grow in that area. Now this next slide could have quite a lot of potential opportunities and will certainly require more, more research. But what it found with um, fruit fly, uh, which is a very big problem all over Australia and many parts of the world, is that when it attacks it, the fruit, um, then that the larvae just goes into the fruit and um, you just have rotten fruit and, and can attack your whole, your whole crop. Now, what he found was when he picked up some of these apples off the ground, and as you say, he'd cut them through, and you can see, um, it looked like there had been an appearance of the fruit fly attack with the pictures there. Um, and as I said, two years ago, it destroyed the whole crop on that particular tree. However, the fruit fly stings are evident, but over three days, the larvae have not hatched. So his understanding was that maybe this plasma field that created an immunity to the pest or somewhere the, the, the plasma fields had interacted with that larvae so that they could not develop any further. And the problem with fruit fly in general is when it lays its, the larvae and the rotten fruit falls on the ground, then that, that larvae goes into the ground and comes again following season. So it's a year after year problem. But if you're able to do this after a couple of years, one could easily eradicate that problem in your area quite nicely. So this certainly is a big area for research in the future. So the summary that, that uh, Ross had, had put together on, on his experience using the plasma in his, in his uh, farm there was that by just by hanging different uh, ping pong balls around his trees or plants, um, and he'd seen a beneficial effect on, on the fruit production. The plasma of CO2 and zinc mixed, mixed with a small amount of um, CH3 and a little bit of copper um, produced these results for him. Um, you notice plant growth was accelerated and very healthy within the fields. Um, and also the plants appeared to have enhanced immunity to disease and insect attack. And this we're finding all over the world as well. And uh, plants coming to the end of their production cycle can be reinvigorated to extend their production period. And um, he said spraying the plasma combined with the different methods of ping pong balls or bottles appear to give the plants immunity to weather extremes as well. Uh, fruit production is dramatically increased and size remains good. So, you know, what he's seen here is, is quite 
nice overall changes in his production and as I said it's compared to all the previous years where he's, he's produced. Another short picture here was from a um, series of pictures from Alex in Canada um, and it is what he'd been doing was throwing a lot of CO2 water into a, a little creek nearby where he lives and um, it's very difficult to see on the pictures, but he had noticed quite a change over the over the several weeks of how he had uh, changed his little pond and the life that was being created in the water and around the plant the pond and the, and the plants and that. And so, just by doing those little little things around our garden or in the river or stream nearby, it's making quite a huge impact in the environment. So we encourage a lot of people just to go and use the CO2 water into, into nature and, and, and spread it into all these rivers and streams. These were other pictures of, of his particular plants that um, he had noticed quite a lot of changes, um, larger leaves, uh, flowering at different times. So, you know, it's all these subtle changes that, that one observes and one can only observe know these changes when you grow in certain plants for a very long period of time. And then just a quick summary of, of our uh, experience with the growing tomatoes in winter as well is um, when we had come to the end of our summertime, we had a couple of tiny little baby seedlings, tomatoes, uh, which we had left over. So I had uh, decided to replant those and see how they grow. Also with the gans in the water. And these are also baby tomato plants. Um, so they don't normally grow very big. Uh, the next series of pictures just shows you their, their growth during the winter time. The first one was sort of midwinter in July for the Southern Hemisphere. And already they had grown quite large because normally they would only sit. We've tried it before a couple of years to grow tomatoes in the winter time, and they would only get, they would stay tiny, very small, look very unhealthy, look very sick, and only start growing when spring came. But these was, were growing very nicely, um, even in the middle of the winter. And the most obvious effect to me was how thick a lot of these stems were um, and particularly because it was a cocktail variety tomato. So the stems were particularly thick for, for growth during the winter time. And this was in September. So it was coming out of winter and, and early, early and it had grown immense size um, during the winter time and had already had lots of flood produced lots of flowers um, so it had grown entirely during this winter period without any greenhouse at all and there's just a close-up of the, the growing tips there and you can see how thick they are and um, so that was very very uh, a big big notice for us as to how strong those plants were and then in October, there we had huge bunches of, of tomatoes there already all starting to ripen and lots of flowers. So this had really taken off during that winter time. So our comments on that one was that we had grown, you know, these plants had grown through winter without being undercover in a greenhouse. And we'd been would have been picking the fruit there end of October compared to maybe December, only January of previous years, um, which show to us that traditional planting and harvesting seasons can be extended on either side of your growing of your traditional growing seasons. And there's no need for expensive greenhouse, greenhouse infrastructure. And the interesting feedback on, on this particular tomato plant is that it continued to grow during uh, the December time and we we're picking lovely tomatoes and then as traditional summer here in Australia gets when um, we had a hot period of over 40 degrees uh, for, for at least a week 
And um, this was just too much for the plant to cope with. And um, it was quite amazing to watch how fast this plant had, had just died. Within two weeks, the plant had just uh, died. And we had noticed that um, the tomatoes were perfect and beautiful. There was not one bit of um, attack by any insects. And then as soon as we had this um, huge heat change, then almost within days, the whole crop of tomatoes had been attacked by uh, the fruit fly. So, you know, the, we're still trying to under, get to understand this, but we're thinking that by creating the conditions and using the plasma around our tomato plants, it had managed to grow throughout the winter. But as soon as we had an extreme heat condition. And as we know, when we experience high heat temperatures, it's a change in the, and um, an increase in the magrav fields. And these were just far too high for what we had created around our tomato plant. And so we had almost a breakdown of that interaction. Um, and the tomato plant just could not cope. So the pest control, which we've seen and a lot of other people have seen, is almost an, an, an I'll call it an unintended side effect of using the plasma, is because what we've seen and many other people have seen is, is almost a reduction in the effects of pests on your crop. Uh, we used to grow under netting and we don't anymore. All our crops are in the open. And we just don't really have a problem of insects and, and caterpillars anymore. Um, and um, so what you're doing is when you're using the plasma is you're changing the whole environment around your farm. You're making your crop and produce a lot more healthier. It becomes happy. And when you have happy, healthy plants, then you're not going to have a pest problem. So we look at things on a completely opposite point of view now is that when we start seeing any uh, caterpillar or any other damage on our plants then we know that our plants are unhappy and unhealthy and so now we go and then look to find out and start changing things to make sure that they are uh, remaining happy and healthy so for us the pests have become our new friends in a way in letting us know the conditions of the plants as well. So it's a totally different view of looking at the pest side. Now we move to Italy. Use grew a uh, parsley using liquid plasma, water of CO2 and zinc oxide. She gave water to the soil around the roots and sprayed the leaves with the plasma water. And this was done for 10 days. And then after 10 days, she left. And when she came back, two months later, the plants had grown like uh, four times the size before she left with very large uh, leaves. You can see to the left here, parsley. She was uh, actually surprised. She thought that couldn't be parsley because of how beautiful it was, I mean, in terms of growth. It was very healthy and very big. She thought it was too big for parsley. But then that shows uh, the effects of uh, those uh, liquid plasmas. And then here again, this is Canada. She, he grew pumpkins. This pumpkins were all supposed to be like the pumpkin first in line where you see the arrow the bottom one to the left but then uh, and that one has a smooth surface orange in color according to the seed package but uh, then when uh, when he grew them with uh, liquid plasmas they changed you can see uh, the products above the, the first one so they are not very smooth as the first one. They have various colors. So what may have happened? Uh, all the seeds were treated with plasma water. With, and the soaking was done overnight from ganses of CO2, zinc, and what he prepared as CH3, but may well as well have been 
deuterium due to the color he noticed, dark color. He had used magnesium salt, Epsom salt, uh, to harvest the ganses. Magnesium was used because it gives a very beneficial position for the plant for the production of chlorophyll. Another process was to mix the plasma water in a blender in order to homogenize and increase potency of the plasma water. So if you uh, put uh, this in a blender, you uh, rotate it, you blend it, it releases energy. So it's more energized, the water is more energized. And this way he says only a small amount of guns is needed to make up a large batch of plasma water by adding more regular water to the mix. So the, the, those are the various colors and textures of the pumpkins that came from one that should have been smooth and, and yellow, pinkish. So what may have happened here is very, very interesting. Uh, we can use CO2 liquid plasma to decontaminate uh, seeds but not only that, where, where you have mixtures, let's say you have two parents and then you hybrid size. Uh, CO2 water can revert them to the originals. So if you have a, a mixed seed and then you use CO2 liquid plasma, you can generally go back to the mother and the father of the, of the one you, you planted. And this may be showing exactly that but tests are ongoing. Uh, to summarize, these changes in condition have produced the following results. Extended shelf life of uh, his food. He grew it in winter or extended seasons, coping with the extreme heat, minimal pest damage, higher yields, healthy, happy produce, equals healthy, happy people. So you are not only growing uh, healthy crops, you are growing, you are supporting healthy people. Helping to improve the whole environment in your area for all creatures. So this, this generally applies to all experiments that use liquid plasma. These changes are only the beginning that we have seen and noted we continue to do more research. And we have barely begun to use the, to use and see this, the full potential. The full potential we have not achieved yet, but uh, we are slowly doing that so in agriculture. Okay, and um, we teach a private class, a private class in agriculture. And if you are interested, you can apply. If you are an agricultural practitioner or an expert in agriculture, or interested, you are interested in learning how to apply plasma into agriculture, you may join the private teaching class. This, uh, you, you write an email to agriculture at kfssi.org.